Good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday. So glad you've joined us this morning for Calvary Online. I get to say good morning for myself and my whole family. Uh, we're looking forward to the day that we can be together again to see each other in person. Uh, for those that are new or haven't joined us that often yet, uh, we do have a website if you want to check that out and press the Connect tab. Uh, we'd love the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. For our church family that continues to give through this difficult time, we just want to express our gratefulness. We're so thankful for your faithfulness. Uh, it's through those givings that we're able to keep the ministry going at Calvary. For those that are unsure how to give, uh, you can check out the website as well. Just press the Give tab and all the information you'll need should be there for you. So just sit tight now and enjoy the service. And uh, looking forward again, like I said, till we see each other again. Hey Calvary, uh, it's Andrew here. And uh, you may have noticed there's someone else on the screen. And uh, we're really excited today to be able to talk to Amanda Romanoli. Uh, you've heard in the, the last couple of weeks that we have hired her as our summer intern to work in the children's ministries. And today uh, we get to hear a little bit from her and we get to have a little chat and bring it to you for our service. Uh, so we're so excited to have Amanda here with us. Thanks, Amanda, for joining us. And uh, to our church family, we miss you, but uh, we hope this little bit of interaction will be a fun way for you to get to know Amanda and to hear a little bit more about her. So Amanda, we're gonna gonna start with a really tough question, really uh, give you a hard one here. Uh, what have you been doing? What's your go-to to pass the time during quarantine? Uh, well, actually quarantine has been pretty busy, maybe a little bit busier than regular life. Um, filled with lots of working. I work at Albright in the kitchen there, so that's been taking up a lot of my time. Um, also video calling all the people that I don't get to hang with at school anymore. Um, lots of Netflix, of course, a little bit of reading, lots of baking, got to use up all those ingredients that we fight in for the grocery store, you know, it's been, yeah, it's been fun. Wow. You, you've been busy. You're uh, that's, you might have to schedule oh, yes. that. That sounds like quite the regime you've got going on. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> so awesome to hear that you're involved with Albright. We, uh, we love Albright and all the people there, all the staff who are helping keep, uh, keep the residents of Albright safe. And um, also this year, uh, many of our church family will know that you're at Heritage. You did a year of Bible college and, uh, and uh, learning so much there, I think. But uh, how would you say that your time at Heritage uh, has really prepared you for life after Bible college? Um, I think... Heritage was such a healthy community to um, form good habits. Um, and I think that definitely like put a regime in my life for um, reading my Bible every day and um, prayer and stuff like that. It was just such a good environment to grow. And um, that's definitely been something that I've carried out of Bible college, even though it ended kind of abruptly. It also helped me get through this kind of um, crazy time. It was like the best way to uh, come into this craziness was coming right out of heritage it was just awesome for that yeah that's so good to hear now uh, I'm sure some of the other students listening to this can relate to finishing uh, a year online what was it like to just abruptly have your semester and your your year at bible college finish online tell us about that it was definitely shocking um because I was only in a one year program, it was kind of like, this was gonna be like a big graduation. It was like the end of my time there completely. Um, so it was definitely disappointing to not be able to have that um, ending with all my roommates and everything, have a big graduation. Um, but it was kind of nice to um, like mellow at the end of the semester, you know, I can't complain about doing class in pajamas outside. Like it was just, it was a really great time for me in that way. But um, yeah, no, it was definitely tough though. Um, especially with that extra degree of organization, having to be um, so on everything all the time um, without having a structured class time and everything. But yeah, yeah. What a, what a unique way. And for all of our students, we've been, we've been thinking of you guys and girls and, uh, how, how difficult and probably stressful it's been finishing off this year. Um, way to go. We're proud of you for, for the way you did finish off the semester. Uh, now, some of the people listening in are our children and our Calvary families and maybe some of the families of our community. Uh, so take a moment to say hi to them and tell them what you're most excited for this summer. Well, uh, hello to all the families and the children. Um, I know this has been a 
tough time and it's been kind of crazy to think about summer, but we have all the time in the world to get excited about what's going to happen this summer. And honestly, we are working really hard to find cool ways that we can all be involved together. Um, I'm really excited to see you guys all again. And um, honestly, camp is just like, I'm a camp kid at heart and I am so excited for camp this summer. Everybody should be excited for camp this summer. Um, I'm just excited to be outside and with everybody all again. So we should all be getting excited and thinking about the things that we want to do at camp this summer and everything. It's going to be really great and I'm really excited. Oh, that's so cool. Now I want to flash back in time. Six-year-old Amanda. What, what did summer look like for six-year-old Amanda Romanoli? Honestly, those were the good old days. I miss, oh man, to be six again would be the dream. Um, summers when I was six were definitely filled with VBS. That was um, a highlight was VBS for the summer. Um, actually, when I was six was a very unique VBS year because I got to invite um, one of my closest friends who is not a Christian to VBS and she came and she started coming to church with her family and it was so awesome. So, um, you know. That was just a great summer for me. Um, I always did swimming lessons. I played soccer. Um, we went camping a lot. Oh, it was just the best. Oh, that sounds awesome. And wow, six-year-old Amanda was already sharing the news about Jesus. Are you hearing that, children? Six years old, you can do that already. That's that's a sweet story. Um, well, you've uh, you talked a little bit about you're a camp kid at heart, and. Um, And I know uh, we've told the church family, you're going to be helping out with Calvary Kids in whatever form it's going to take over the next few months, as well as camp. Um, We definitely want to be reaching out to our camp children in whatever way we can, and hopefully that's physically in person running camp. But uh, tell us a little bit about your experience in children's ministry, maybe camp ministry, and what makes you so passionate uh, about reaching out to children and their families? Yeah, um, I've been involved in a lot of um, different kind of camp and kids ministries. Um, I was in Sunday school. I'm sure a lot of you had me as your teacher or helper in Sunday school for the past few years. Um, I actually worked at the Calvary camp a really long time ago, too, and that was a really good experience. Uh, I was a CIT. It was it was really fun. Um, I also have gone to the OCA camp in Shelburne. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of you know the Willard family, um, Zeke specifically, and me and Zeke go to that camp and we are uh, in charge of music and we do a lot of fun things with the kids there. Um, so that was really fun. Um, but honestly, I just, I'm so enthusiastic about camp because I went to camp every summer when I was growing up and I did VBS every summer and um, it was just always the highlight for me. Um, camp just has this way of setting everybody on fire and uh it's just like you come home from camp and you're just on this great camp high and uh I think that's something so special and um when we're on fire like that uh that's when the best work can be done for God so I think that definitely working at camp and coming to camp at Calvary is just like such a great experience it's so fun wow that's that's so exciting to hear hey you you know how to preach it and just get people passionate and excited. I, I think you should stick around after this and be the one to give the message in a few minutes. But you know oh, what? We, we'll, we'll let you have a couple more days before you, before you get into the office. Just in case our church family didn't know, uh, uh, this coming Monday, May 4th, is going to be technically Amanda's uh, first day in the office. And so uh, we want to make sure we're praying for you. And I just want to ask, I want to finish off by asking, how can we be praying for you this week as you get started but also this summer, as you uh, as you spend the time as our summer intern, how can we be praying for you? Um, I think definitely uh, I could use prayer for guidance. This is definitely a tough time for all of us, just trying to um, figure out the ropes on this new situation, um, how, what everything is going to look like this summer. So definitely guidance for that. Um, also, like a good sense of peace. This is definitely a stressful time. It's full of lots of anxiety um, for a lot of people. And I think um, definitely just like the comfort of knowing that God's in control and that um, it's all going to work itself out in a very unique way. Um, yeah. Well, we can definitely be praying for that. And uh, before we let you go and we uh, continue on with our service, well, why don't I pray for all of us right now? 
Father, we are so thankful to to hear the work that you're doing in Amanda's life and to to hear the passion you've given her for camp ministry and children's ministry and uh, for you, and most importantly, her relationship with Christ and how you've been journeying with her in this last year at Bible College, but in uh, in the last several years as she's walked with you and learned more about you and um, and and really just grown in her faith. We can't wait to see how you're going to use her here at Calvary in this in this coming few months this summer. And, and we do ask uh, for exactly what Amanda is saying. We, uh, one of the things we ask especially is that you will uh, bring the perfect resolution to COVID-19 and that we'll trust your plan and that we'll learn uh, what you have uh, for us to learn, that you'll keep those safe who are uh, vulnerable or who are um, risking their own health and their own well-being to be able to go out and protect others, to be able to serve others, to be able to work and keep our economy going. We thank you for them. Thank you for all those who are um, doing their best to be patient and to wait and to just uh, hope that we can all contribute to uh, to flattening the curve and to um, ending COVID-19 or at least um, getting this virus under control. We pray for your resolution and we pray uh, for what's going to happen with camp. We, we would love to be able to meet in person. We'd love to be able to welcome the children in our community, in our church family to to the camp and that you'd work in their lives and you'd show them how important a relationship with Jesus is. Uh, but even if it can't be in person, we're excited to to think of creative ways to be interacting with our families online. So as Amanda has said, exactly what you have planned will happen. And so, Lord, we trust that you're in control. We ask that you'll give Amanda and our volunteers and our directors and our staff uh, and our whole church family comfort and peace and just such a confidence to know that we can continue to trust in you. Uh, Lord, we we uh, we want your will to happen. We trust your will. Um, we pray for our church family who's hurting this week and uh, just ask that you'll give them a special measure of your grace that uh, those of us who are able will, will give phone calls, will give uh, just little encouragements, emails, notes, letters, and just reminding people we're thinking of them and praying for them. And we celebrate with our church family. We celebrate with Andrew and Victoria today. They're great news uh, from this past week. We celebrate with uh, Brandon and Laura and Avery and Paige and little baby Brooklyn. We're so excited uh, for these families and the great news that they have. And we want to continue to support each other and be a family that loves each other and that loves our community. All for your glory for your praise and so that we can continue to grow with you and grow to trust you and depend on you. In Jesus' name, amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled
I'll return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the light, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh. Hey, do you remember when you moved out of your parents' house for the last time? Some of you are thinking, I had great plans to move out, and then this COVID-19 thing happened, and I've had to wait. Our youth are thinking, I dream about the day that I get my freedom and I can finally be gone. Others of us have moved back home since this whole COVID thing started. I remember the first time that I moved out when I was in college. It was like every time I came home for the weekend, there were three things that my mom would say to me. Hey, son, great to see you. When are you leaving? My mom's probably watching this morning, and she would say, Andrew, the only reason I asked that is because I wanted to plan the weekend perfectly for you. But Ma, I can take a hint. There's a natural progression that happens. As we grow up, we move out, for most of us at least. Maybe your family rule was 24 and out the door. Well, it's not too different with our faith in Jesus. There comes a point in our relationship with Jesus where we need to move out. As we jump back into our study in the book of Acts, you can grab a Bible now and start turning to Acts. Uh, We have been tracking with Paul and some of his buddies like Barnabas as they go out for the first time. Uh, If you're a guest with us, if you've been away for a little while, we want to tell you we've been in this series called Learning How to Church, and we've been journeying with the brand new baby church. It's about 15 years after Jesus was on earth, and we've been learning lessons of what it means to be and to function like and to live as the church. And here's what Luke, the guy who wrote Acts, wants us to realize today. Eventually, you've got to move out. Gathering together as God's people, doing this thing we call church, this community, praying together, growing together, having church services together, that's great. But if you want to be a follower of Jesus, at some point you have to move out with his message. If, if for you all the extent of church is, is that you just punch in on the Christian clock at about 10.30 on Sunday morning, or let's be honest, 10.35, And then at 12 o'clock, you punch out for Sunday chicken. If that's all church is to you, then you have missed the point of the book of Acts so far. Uh, Even if you have subscribed to our prayer alerts and you've joined a life group and, and you do these other studies so you can go deeper into the Bible, but you never actually get to the point where you share your faith in Jesus. You have missed the point. You see, It means that you've not fully grown up in your faith. Unless you move out with that message, you haven't grown up. And if that's so important, then what does it look like to move out? Well, you can turn to Acts chapter 13, and we're going to see firsthand what it was like when the church, when Paul and his buddies move out with the message of Jesus for the first official time. Turn there in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, take your phone and just download the YouTube Bible app, uh, sorry, the Version Bible app. You'll be right there with us. Uh, for, for our children, we have this little worksheet for you to work through. It's in the description below. Uh, adults, we have a sermon note sheet that you can find on the description below. Children, get ready because the answer to the first question is about to come. Acts chapter 13, and, and here's the thing. 
if you want to be someone who shares your faith, who moves out, but you just don't know how, Luke, the writer of Acts, is going to give us a template for how to share your faith. But you might be thinking, I just joined this thing. I, I've never even been to your church before, and you're kicking me out already? No, we're not kicking you out. We're so glad that you're here, and you're never kicked out. But I want you to hear from Luke's own story, this real biblical story, what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus, how you can live for him. Thank you so much for being here, by the way. Well, why don't we all join together in Acts chapter 13 and begin this story. Here's what Luke says, verse 1. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. If Luke were here today, what he would probably tell you is that moving out with the message of Jesus was simply the result of the church being the church. They were worshiping together. In this case, uh, for them, that meant that they were especially praying and fasting. They were committing themselves to God. And as they were doing that, there was this prompting from the Holy Spirit to set apart, to commission is a word we sometimes use, to send out Barnabas and Saul, who, who, if you know the rest of the story, becomes Paul, famous Paul. Moving out is the result of worshiping God, of seeking God and just listening to Him, and then listening when He prompts us. Worshiping God and then listening to His promptings. And notice here we get a strategy, really the first spirit-led strategy for the church to move out. It's a reminder in verse 4 for us as they send the two of them out, by the Holy Spirit, that having a vision, having a strategy and a plan to reach people is not a bad thing, and it doesn't make it about the numbers. We as elders, we've been praying and planning and strategizing for over a year now how we as a church can be loving on our community. Uh, Our whole dream is that we would be, all the people at Calvary would have a love for the community and would show that love to the community and that we would all share the gospel, the good news of Jesus in the places we live, work, and play. And here we see kind of the first formal organization uh, of this strategy for outreach. They send out Paul and Barnabas. So you might think to yourself, yeah, but that's, that's, Paul, that's Apostle Paul. He's the great, famous evangelist. He went to new lands and he planted churches. I'm not called to cross the sea and to reach other people. Well, you may not be called to board a ship or get on a plane, but all of us have been called to bring the message of Jesus to others. And that call takes different forms. Uh, For some of us, it's a short-term missionary trip. Uh, Maybe you've heard the story of one of our high school girls, Rachel, and how she recently just went on a short-term mission trip. We hope we get to hear more of that story soon and can report on all that she learned and what God did through her. Uh, We have a rich history as a church uh, of having uh, partnering with great missions locally, globally, nationally. Uh, We have retired missionaries in our church family, and we want to support these kind of things. This is, this is part of how God uses us to bring the message of Jesus to others. But here's the point. All of us are called to bring the message of Jesus to others. It's not just the pastors and the teachers and the evangelists and the missionaries. All of us are called. And so how do we do that? If, if I feel like God has been prompting me that I need to, to bring this message to someone, where do I even start? Well, for Paul and Barnabas, their example is that you start with low-hanging fruit. (laughs) Look for the opportunities that God has placed around you. You might even call these easy wins. They begin in this missionary trip in Cyprus. That's Barnabas' hometown. So they just go back to Salamis, sorry, the island of Cyprus. Salamis is the city that they go to, and that's where Barnabas was from. Luke doesn't really make anything of it, but it could have been an advantage or a disadvantage for for Barnabas. But they go back home, and sometimes back home people are receptive, and and you probably have experienced when the people back home are kind of cold toward our faith. But that's where they start. And then verse 5, look where they go when they get to Salamis. Verse 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. In the Jewish synagogues. 
Barnabas and Paul were Jews, and so they simply started with their own people. But if you're familiar with the Bible, if you've read the Old Testament, the Jews, Israel, they were God's chosen people. So the people in the synagogue, as they were reading, they knew the Old Testament, at least what for us is the Old Testament. They knew it inside and out. Paul and Barnabas are going to God's people and showing them all that you're reading has been fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And so for Paul and Barnabas, it was natural for them to go to the synagogues. Uh, For you, though, it might be a little bit different. Uh, Maybe it's a neighbor who's religious, or or they used to go to church, but they don't anymore. Uh, I've been noticing that in our region, there are a lot of nominal Christians. They just don't necessarily participate in church. As I've been talking to some of my neighbors, I'm learning they have a history of church, but they just don't go anymore. And so I keep on praying, God, Would you be working in their lives? Give me opportunities to share the message and the life of Jesus with them. But what you need to realize is as you pray for these opportunities, expect opposition. Because when you move out, sometimes people will accept what you're saying and there will be great opportunities. And other times you'll get rejected for it. Paul quickly learns in this passage that while going to the Jews might have been low-hanging fruit, It's not going to be without its opposition. And so as the story continues in chapter 13, he meets a guy named Bar-Jesus, son of Jesus. Uh, Ironic name because uh, he's actually totally against the Christian faith. Uh, Alemus is his other name. And so while they're in Cyprus, while they're on the island, he's trying to share about Jesus, Paul is. And this guy is opposing him at every corner. They get to a point where they meet a proconsul, the guy who Alemus works for, a Roman official, and they start sharing. He wants to hear more about God, the text tells us. And so they start sharing, but they're opposed at every corner. And eventually there's this amazing moment where Paul just says, you child of the devil, to Alemus. It's like a mic drop moment. And then he actually tells him, you are about to go blind. And instantly God makes Alemus blind. And at that moment, you can go to Acts chapter 13, verse 12. When the proconsul, this Roman official, saw what had happened, he believed. For he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. He was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. What an amazing story about how God can work in someone's life and people will accept the gospel. You see, sometimes we will get rejected. If we're going to move out with this message of Jesus, people will reject us. But if you're relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the theme that keeps coming up in Acts chapter 13, by God's grace, some will also accept the message. So be on the lookout for open doors where you can share the message of Jesus. Now, don't hear me saying that you should only share your faith when it's easy. Paul is going to go through tons of opposition the rest of the book of Acts. But where people are are hardened to the message of Jesus, where they don't want to hear anymore, you don't have to feel a pressure because you can continue to look for opportunities. You don't have to force it. On the other hand, when God opens a door, make sure you walk through it. When God opens a door, make sure you walk through it. In verse 15 of our passage, now we're traveling a little further in the story. The guys are now in Poseidon, Antioch today. That would be southern Turkey. And again, they're following this pattern. They're starting with their low-hanging fruit. They go into the synagogue, Luke tells us. And then as the, I'll just read it, verse 15, after the reading from the law and the prophets. So basically, they've read the Old Testament, what the Jews believe. The leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, brothers, if you have a word of exhortation, please speak. Can you picture the Apostle Paul right now? His eyes are lighting up. He's like, uh, children, imagine if your kids take you to Toys R Us and they just show you the store and they say, pick whatever toy you want. Uh, Men. Imagine uh, you're in front of the TV and your wife says to you, hey, honey, tonight we're going to watch whatever you want to watch. What? Sports? You'll watch sports with me? Do you remember when we watched sports? Oh, my goodness, I miss it. This is Paul's moment. He must have been thinking, where do I begin? I have so much to say. And then he realizes, I'm talking to Jewish people. I'm going to start with, with on their level. I'm going to talk about all that Christians and Jews have in common. 
And so Paul begins to share in the rest of Acts chapter 13. He talks about Israel back when they left Egypt, the exodus, the famous event for Jewish people. He talks about the traveling through the wilderness and, and the promised land and how they conquered Canaan. He talks about the judges and Samuel, the last judge, first prophet. He talks about the time that they had kings when Saul was the first king. David was the greatest king in Old Testament history. And then he skips a thousand years and he just jumps straight to Jesus. Let me just, let me read it. It's so good we need to read this part of the passage. Verse 26 of chapter 13. Fellow children of Abraham, which is another way to say Jewish people, and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their ruler, rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had him carried out, all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him down in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised to our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. Paul is showing these Jewish people in the synagogue what you are reading about. Everything in the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, this was all pointing to Jesus, whom your ancestors, whom our ancestors killed, not realizing he was the one who God sent. And here's the example for us. When you're trying to move out, when you want to share the message of Jesus, it's as simple as just telling his story wherever you go. When God opens the door, though, you've got to walk through it. Moving out requires walking through open doors. And you might think to yourself, that sounds like common sense. But unless our conversations about our faith and, and with our neighbors, with our friends and our loved ones, unless the conversation gets to Jesus, we haven't really left the laneway. And I'm preaching to myself here. If we want to be on mission for Jesus, eventually our conversations need to mention his work and his work in our lives. A couple months ago, I was traveling, and I needed to take an Uber, so I'm searching the app, and I find a guy. His name was Dil Pre. He, he was a five-star rating. I'm thinking, this is going to be a great ride. And so we get in the car. I realize it's going to be a 20-minute drive, so I just start asking about him. Hey, tell me about your life. Quickly, he tells me that he's a Sikh, or as he kind of pronounced it, it sounded like sick. And I was like, i got to be honest, I, I don't know anything about Sikhism. Can, can you tell me about it? And so he begins to share with me some of the core things that Sikh, Sikh people believe. And as he's sharing, I'm just thinking, whoa. And then all of a sudden he stops and he says, hey, what do you believe happens to us after we die? And I'm thinking, what? I thought moments like this only happened to Billy Graham. And I'm kind of looking around. I'm pretty nervous, uh, realizing there's no hatch, no escape hatch. So I'm stuck here. The doors are locked. The car's probably going a little too fast to do the tuck and roll. I'm in for this. So I just say a quick prayer. God, this is my moment. It's happening. And I begin to explain to him, well, you know what, Del Pri, I, I believe there's nothing that I can do to make me good enough for God. And so on my own, I'm toast after this life. But then I begin to explain to him that because I have a relationship with Jesus, because of what Jesus has done to pay for my sins, I get to have a relationship with God, and I will live with God forever. And I'm confident of that. And then I pull this beauty line. I say, what do you think of that, Del Pri? He says, yes, this is good. It's very important to have religion. I believe in God also. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, I... I try to steer the conversation a little bit more back to Jesus, but sure enough, we get to the end of the drive. We have the friendly goodbye. He gives me the five-star rating. I got to be honest, I really think my gospel presentation was more of a two or a three, but then we go on our separate ways. And, and as I get to the hotel that night, I'm thinking, Lord, I just pray that you'll work in Del Priest's life. Take that little seed, that little cock that we had, and grow it into something great. And I don't tell that story to tell you how amazing an evangelist Andrew is because it was really sloppy. And I can tell you like 10 stories of times that I failed to share my faith. 
But the point is, if we truly want to move out, if we want to take the message of Jesus out, eventually the conversation has to be about him. Eventually we've got to talk about what he did for us and how we can have a relationship with him. You can do that naturally. Uh, relationships where you know the person and they know you care about them and, and they trust you, those are the best ways to do it. Cold turkey like I tried, probably not your best way to do it. But as you get to know them, naturally work the conversation into those things and, and make it a gradual process, but eventually get to Jesus. As a church, we have tried to create all sorts of opportunities partnering with our community, uh, events that we do where we're hoping you can have some easy win opportunities like Convos, our youth zone, like our partnership with Community Care and Albright, uh, this building renovation that we're Lord willing going to do someday. We want it to be all about how the ministry of Calvary can continue and especially how we can tell our community about what Jesus has done for us. But do you have a neighbor? Do you have a loved one who keeps coming on to your mind? Maybe God is trying to open a door for you. But to my friends who, who you don't have a relationship with Jesus, or, or maybe you used to go to church, you used to believe this stuff, but you're just not sure it makes a difference anymore. I promise that if you hung in with us, Paul would even have a lesson for you about what it means to follow Jesus. As you continue in Acts 13, he has a message just for you. Look at verse 38. He says, therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. What Paul is saying here is, for those of you who think you're good enough to get into heaven, I just have to be a nice person and I'm good to go. Or, or you think that if you maintain some sort of standard of morality, then you'll keep God happy. If you think, I just got to keep the Ten Commandments, and then I'm good to go, you weren't told the whole truth. See, the truth is, at our deepest, darkest core, none of us is really a nice person. And when it comes to morality, none of us keeps the standard that God has. But thank God, He sent His Son, Jesus, into the world to be the perfect standard for us, so that when you say to God, God, I know I'm not good enough for you, but today I'm placing my faith in Jesus because I know he was perfect, he is perfect, and he sacrificed his life on a cross, what we talk about on Good Friday and Easter, so that I could be forgiven. And when he rose again, when he came back from the dead, as all these apostles, as the first disciples witnessed, he proved he was God. He proved that when I put my faith in him, I can have a relationship with you. I can have eternal life. Paul continues in verse 40, Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you, should never, that you would never believe, even if someone told you. Paul says, make sure today that you do something about that. Stop right now and just pray. Say, God, I believe it. I believe that I deserve punishment and I don't want to be punished. I don't have to be punished. I'm putting my faith in Jesus today. Thank you for his sacrifice on my behalf. Paul and Barnabas, as the story continues, chapter 13 into verse 14, uh, the people are so... Uh, enthused about what they're saying. They want them to come back the next week. And so they keep traveling. They, they continue going to these synagogues. Chapter 14, they go to a few more cities. And, and at every stop, some people are interested. Other people are indifferent. And then still others are violently opposed to what these guys are doing. After about a year and a half, they return home. And Luke tells the story in chapter 14. It's the very end of chapter 14 of what their homecoming, what their mission report was like. Chapter 14, here's what Luke says, verse 26. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all God had done through them and how he'd opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. I began this morning by telling a cheesy story about when I go back home. And the truth is, uh, once you move out and, and you love the people back home, 
coming home, your homecoming is so special. As much as I tease my mom, and I probably remember the story differently than it actually happened, the truth is she's always texting. She's always calling and saying, when are you guys coming to visit? And I know it's partially because there's a grandbaby who she's missing like crazy. But moving out makes coming home special. Moving out makes coming home special. Just like family reunions where we all catch up and we tell stories about what's been going on in our lives. The church gathering, doing church on Sundays, is supposed to be a place of catching up about all that God is doing. But here's the thing. If we never move out, if we never leave this community that we have on Sunday morning of Christians and church, and we never take this message of Jesus to others, then our homecoming reports about what God is doing are actually kind of self-serving. When Paul and Barnabas came home and they gathered and they worshiped, and it's great, I can't wait till we can do that in person again. But did you see in the text what it was that they were celebrating? They were celebrating how God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. They were celebrating that people put their faith in Jesus. What's the one thing, what is the thing that you're celebrating? Is it that we have a bunch of land that we don't know how to use? Like 14 acres or something like that? Is it that Calvary is now a church that's like 90 years old? Those are great things. I love our history. It's so, we've been blessed with the land that we have. But are we just celebrating the things that serve us? Or are we still celebrating that God is working in our town and in our region, in our country, in our world, and people are coming to believe in Jesus? Jesus said that when one sinner believes, there's a party going on in heaven. I want to be a church that likes to party. Don't you want to be that church? The alternative is that we just have a holy huddle. And we'll just try to keep this little community that we call Calvary, the church family, we'll just try to keep what we have. But Jesus has called us to gather, so important, and then to scatter, equally as important. Worship and mission should go hand in hand. Jesus, Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them. All nations, we need to go. Acts 1, the very beginning of this book, you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to tell the story about me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Scattering makes the gathering that much more special. It's precious. What a powerful reminder these last couple of months have been that the church is so much more than a building. Is it possible that God has us scattered right now because he wants to open a door for you to share the message of Jesus? He wants you to walk through that door. Can you imagine the party that we will have when we get back together and we start sharing stories about how God has been using us in the lives of our neighbors and our loved ones and and those all around us? It could be as simple as just hitting the share button below this video and saying, hey, Here's a message I want you to listen to because it's going to tell you what I believe about Jesus. And I would be happy to follow up with you. Would you have a Zoom coffee with me afterwards? And we'll talk about what what that pastor said. We'll talk about that passage. Let me ask you a question as we close, though. When are you going to move out? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word to us. Through Luke, through this guy who wrote down the story of the early church. Uh, But Lord, we know it's not just some document. It's not just some history. It has relevance for our lives. I pray that we will be motivated, that we'll be stirred up to want to see our friends and our loved ones know Jesus because it makes all the difference in the world. It's the most important decision that they can make. Uh, I pray that you would help us to be on mission, that we would realize it's up to you to change hearts, but you want us to move out. You want us to be faithful. I pray for anyone who's here this morning listening in and, and 
doesn't believe this message, I pray that you'd continue working on their heart. You'd give them the courage to ask the questions that they have, to dialogue with us about the real possibility that Jesus really is who he said he is, and that he did die and rise again so their sins could be forgiven. Thank you for the promise of eternal life. Thank you for new life in Jesus. We want to give you all the praise, all for your glory, not so that Calvary or any of our churches become famous, so that the name of Jesus becomes famous. In his name we pray. Amen.